All right. Thank you all. We're going to move on to a panel talking about tools. And I um, wanted to thank Tim, did a great job with his last question of setting up the importance of data and tools in our decision making realm. Um, so I'm going to just set up for a minute the purpose of the um, panel here and why, we, why we're talking about this. Um, and then I'm going to have the panelists introduce themselves. So when we talk about tools in this context, um, fundamentally what we're saying is we are talking about ways in which we convey meaningful messages about complicated underlying data. So we're taking complex issues and trying to turn them into useful information. Um, and they are really, they're a cornerstone of informed decision making. So we have data, but unless we can get that data into a meaningful concept, it's not really useful for decision makers. Um, tools are particularly critical in the climate change discussion. And there are kind of three reasons behind this. So first of all, climate change is an enormously complicated subject. Um, so we tend to talk about things in buckets. So we talk about changing temperature, we talk about changing precipitation, we talk about sea level rise. But the truth is, not only are all of these going on simultaneously, they are all affecting each other. Um, and so they're not actually individual topics. They're really very integrated topics. And the decisions we make affect how those things change, and then also how much of an impact we have from those changes. So this complication makes it really hard to explain to decision makers, which is why we tend to talk about one piece at a time. Um, now, there are some good tools. There's a, a global simulator named En-ROADS that's been used by the UN that allows people to pull different levers of both decision making and uh, climate scenarios and to look at how those decisions change the environment around us. Um, but it's still a very complicated thing to do. Um, climate change is simultaneously global, regional, and local issues. And so there are a lot of different scales on which information is relevant. And each decision maker has a different scale that's relevant to them. So tools need to be specific to the end use, right? So your scale of decision making has to match the scale of the information. If I tell you global, the global rate at which sea level rise is coming up, it is actually much lower than how fast sea level is coming up in Virginia. So it doesn't really help you make a good decision in Virginia. Um, secondly, climate change is one of the topics where scientists and decision makers tend to have very different backgrounds and very different concerns. Um, and so the scientists often come at it from a much more global perspective, and decision makers often come at it from a more regional and local perspective. So tools can help us bridge the gaps between those two things. And then thirdly, a, a good tool can help support equity, and that's important as we deal with climate change. Um, so about 10 years ago, for example, in Virginia, we had the urbanized communities, we're starting to hire consultants to come in and say, how is flooding and sea level rise going to impact our communities? What can we do about it? These were very expensive studies. Um, the military, the naval base actually had a very big study done for the naval base. But the rural localities weren't doing much. And part of that might have been a lack of political will, but part of it was that they didn't actually have the resources to hire big consulting firms to come in and tell them what to do. So VIMS, in collaboration with colleagues here at William & Mary, um, some of the state agencies and nonprofit, local nonprofits, we began an effort to build an umbrella tool called Adapt VA. And this platform provides sea level rise and flood forecasting for all localities in Virginia. Um, it provides risk analyses for all localities in Virginia and adaptation information that can be used specifically by Virginia decision makers at both the state and local level. Um, one of the things we didn't anticipate actually is that it's used a lot by decision makers at the individual level. Um, and that was not something we had thought about when we started the process, but people use this information to say, I'm not gonna park my car on the street tonight because it is going to flood. <laughs> um, or actually I hear more and more people say to me, I looked at your tool before deciding where to buy a house. So it's starting to come into lots of different um, aspects. 
Um, we've also built a specific environmental justice tool for the nonprofit, the Elizabeth River Project, that allows them to incorporate both EJ considerations and climate change considerations as they do their restoration project planning. So, um, in summary, I guess tools are really a critical part of adapting to climate change. So our panel today is gonna to talk about the importance of the tools that they have created and used, and they're also gonna talk about techniques that can help us cross that communication gap between science and how we get it into policy and decision making. So what I'm gonna do is they all have um, wonderful bios. If you click on your, um, your QR code there, you can see their bios. The all scientists, it's an all scientists panel, um, with lots of experience. Um, but I'm not gonna tell you their bios, okay? Because you can read those. So I'm gonna ask them actually to each go through and just quickly introduce themselves and talk about their role and how they use science to interact with decision makers. And um, we're gonna start at this end, Chris, and we'll move down to Christine. I'm Chris Delia. <clears throat> I'm professor and dean at the College of the Coast and Environment at Louisiana State University. I've uh, been in that role for almost 14 years now, which is a long time for a dean. Um, I'm about to step down at the end of this uh, semester. Um, I've had a, a variety of roles over the years, uh, from being a scientist at the, at, uh, the professorial level, uh, a long time in Maryland at Chesapeake Biological Lab, of the uh, uh, University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, and uh, also as an administrator. And I've had numerous interactions with, with policymakers uh, throughout the course of my career. Uh, I've testified in front of Congress many times. I've testified in front of the uh, Senate and the Commonwealth of Virginia, in fact. Uh, and uh, about a lot of different topics. Obviously, in Louisiana, we have big problems with uh, subsidence, relative sea level, several rise, and, and coastal land loss. We also had a major oil spill that you probably heard of. And, uh, and in all of these events, I had numerous interactions with policymakers. My uh, faculty is uh, very much engaged in helping the state of Louisiana develop its plans for how it's going to cope with the inevitable sea level rise that we're seeing. How's that? Perfect, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Ann Jackson. I'm with Noblis, which is a science, technology, and engineering uh, nonprofit uh, advisory services company. Uh, although I have to admit, I, wouldn't, I don't think of myself as a scientist, so I'm, I'm quite honored to be with this distinguished panel. Uh, my background is actually in um, architecture uh, design and, and the construction and infrastructure industry. Um, so I, I started out my career working in architecture firms and, and uh, specifically focusing on environmental certifications like uh, LEED for, for construction and renovation projects. Um, my work at Noblis is part of our um, a, a sustainability and resilience team, and that's under um, our defense mission area. So um, one of my clients is actually the office of the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Defense, uh, of Defense for uh, Environment and Energy Resilience. Uh, so, you know, the types of advisory services that we're providing are recommendations about policy and how to implement policy. Uh, and then uh, another uh, client that I work with, the General Services Administration, specifically the Office of High Performance uh, Buildings, is uh, and the project I work on, uh, the Sustainable Facilities Tool, is actually a, an online tool that's specifically designed to help the federal workforce uh, with a specific focus on federal facilities um, to implement, uh, you know, uh, strategies to actually meet uh, policy goals. So um, I'm excited to be on this panel and, and thank you so much for having me here. Hi, good morning. My name is Derek Loftus. Derek, you'll have to work. turn it on. Good morning, my name is Dr. Derek Loftus. I work at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science and their Center for Coastal Resources Management 
And a lot of my research focuses on hydrodynamic modeling and forecasting, but I also do a lot of work in sensor development that helps us uh, dynamically identify where flooding is happening in real time, and then we also drive forecasts with those sensor data as well. A lot of my other experience is dealing with geographic information systems mapping, because it's a very dynamic way for people to see you know, where these forecasts of water levels are going to be and what is the relative extent relative to where they live and where they work. And seeing streets between those two places affecting their commute over time uh, is a very empowering way for people to be able to identify, you know, how is this going to radically change my life in the coming future. Um, from a hydrodynamic modeling standpoint, the tools that Molly, our moderator, mentioned earlier, uh, working in the Center for Coastal Resources Management, a lot of the tools that go into ADAPT Virginia that are dealing with forecasts are developed by hydrodynamic modelers like myself and Dr. Joseph Zhang in the Center for Coastal Resources Management. He developed the SCISM hydrodynamic model that's currently used by the Chesapeake Bay Program to help uh, identify a lot of their future you know, water quality targets. Um, and what's really interesting about the hydrodynamic modeling elements is that it kind of helps us see what the future is going to look like in the context of climate change, sea level rise, and a lot of the other different facets that will affect our lives in the near future. Can everyone hear me okay? I apologize for my voice. I have a toddler and I'm perpetually just, this is my voice now. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm Krista Romita Grahalski. I'm a physical scientist at the RAND Corporation. Um, and I am also the lead principal investigator for the Mid-Atlantic uh, Climate Adaptation Partnership, or CAP, uh, formerly RISA program uh, called MARISA. Um, as a member of uh, RAND Corporation, all of our research is focused on policy, so I get to live in this great world where I have a background in physics and astronomy, and I get to ap apply that to um, decision-making and policy every single day. And as part of MARISA, we get to, we're focused on being more of a boundary organization. It's a NOAA-funded center, rather than doing just um, focusing only on doing the science part of things. We're focused on actually taking all that science in a form that is useful to decisions and decision makers in the mid-Atlantic region. So as an extroverted scientist, I actually get to go out and talk to people about what they need um, and figure out tools and ways to give it to them. Um, and that's one of my favorite parts of my job, um, is actually talking to folks. And um, a lot of my work over the past several years with Marisa has been focused on co-production of tools. So whenever we as scientists often go about making a tool, we come out with a very different mental model than people who actually need to use that tool for decision making and don't have subject matter expertise in the science behind it. And so whenever I go talk to someone, I inevitably have a draft of how I think this tool should go, and they immediately blow it out of the water and say, this is not how I think about this at all. And then we kind of combine our, our expertise together and try to create something that's accessible, um, easy to use, and uh, applies to the specific decisions that we're trying to support. And I can talk more about some of that later. Thank you all. Um, so we're going to start the conversation actually a little bit a little bit moving back. So we're going to talk about tools, but we're going to start by talking about uncertainty, because uncertainty in climate change is actually the thing that makes it most difficult to convey. <laughs> it makes it the most difficult to plan for. Um, so I'm going to start, and I'm going to ask Anne and then Krista if you guys could talk a little bit about what do you think are the critical areas of uncertainty in climate change that hinder decision making? So as I mentioned, I'm not a scientist, but uh, so when I was thinking about this question, I was actually thinking of it less about the uncertainties of how our climate is changing and more about what climate impacts are bringing uncertainty into um, the, uh, the infrastructure and the um, assets that, that we are going to be needing to uh, upgrade, replace, reinvest in because of their vulnerability to, uh, to changes in our climate and what that's going to mean for planning and maintenance and, and financing. So, you know, I think about the types of infrastructure assets that we've been building now, uh, building out our communities and our country. And those assets, as a general rule, and we're talking about things as 
as different as roads and, and transportation infrastructure like bridges and, and transit systems are buildings in both commercial and, and residential sector and industrial and utility type infrastructure. So, you know, our energy systems and uh, water treatment and manufacturing. And, and so the types of life cycles that we've projected out for those types of, of assets are maybe anywhere from, say, 40 to, to 75 years. And, and that's what our, our, our budgeting and our financing and our asset management planning is based on. And I think what we're seeing is that in, in large part because of um, the vulnerability that those assets have to increased heat and drought and storms and erosion, that those assets are not staying in good condition as long as, as we had projected. So I think there's an uncertainty about what the true life cycle of our assets really is. And then I think there's a couple of other aspects to this issue, which are we are dealing with this in, 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 in an environment of, of fiscal restraint so that we're, we're not investing in our infrastructure the way that we, we might once have. And then I think to add another layer onto that, we have a challenging political environment. And I, I don't mean political in the sense that a changing climate, for whatever reason, has become a political issue. I mean more the, the political environment of election cycles and competing priorities and suspicion of government that makes it really difficult to make decisions and plan in the long term for the kinds of infrastructure that we have become accustomed to, that we rely on, that we'll need in the future. So I kind of see a lot of uncertainty in that area. And then an, another dimension, I think, is uncertainties about new technologies and new industries. So we you know, have built an economy that's the, the foundation of which is you know, cheap fossil fuels, and we um, will need to transition to new energy sources and, and new technologies and, and new industries. And so I think there's some uncertainties in, in, in this area, which um, I would characterize as there's a lot of entrenched industries and technologies that may be at risk of being displaced, displaced. And so what is that going to look like? And then I think there's a couple of other aspects like how, you know, are we, whether and how we're going to rebuild our, our assets and, and our communities. So, you know, I think in terms of the conversations we've already been having today about uh, coastal communities and, um, and vulnerability, vulnerability to flooding, there's obviously this question of when we have a disaster, are we going to build back? How are we going to build back? What is that going to look like? Um, and, and so then, Finally, I think what I would say is that, in, especially when I'm thinking of this from you know, kind of a buildings um, perspective, an infrastructure perspective, I think there's a real uh, fear of, of the, the risk of failure when using new technologies, new materials, new methodologies. And I think that's understandable in some respects because we, um, especially as you know, builders and, and contractors and, and, and architects, we, we know or we think we know, you know how the things that we've been doing and the tools that we've been using, how they perform. And, and so we you know, just kind of stick with the status quo, build the way that we've, we've been building. And, and that makes sense in some respects from a public safety standpoint, you know, understanding or thinking that you understand what the risks are. But I think that that introduces a different kind of risk, which is the risk of um, not being able to transition the where and, 
and when and, and how we need to for the, the, the coming um, actions that we'll need to take to address climate change. So uncertainty is something that we as humans are not good at at all, um, and something that, a question that I get a lot when we're talking to people is, can I just have a number? Um, can, can you just tell me how much the sea is going to rise? Can you just tell me how much rain we're going to get? And unfortunately, from a physics perspective, the answer is absolutely not. Um, and so the one that is the hardest for me, for folks, you can, you can communicate trends in temperature and sea level rise, I think, a little bit more easily. Um, we have good visualizations for what that kind of looks like. People know what it means for it to be hot. Um, but a pro projects that I've been working on lately have been focused on extreme precipitation in the Mid-Atlantic region. And that one, I think, is particularly difficult. Because not only do I have to try to explain, OK, well, there's uncertainty in the global climate models that have been downscaled to regional climate models. So, this is your answer, plus or minus this giant, this range. <laughs> um, and you have to pick in here because, of course, you have to plan to a specific number. And I can talk to you about why you might choose different aspects in that uncertainty range. People are, beyond that, people are worried about these kind of cloudburst events. And then they'll ask me about that. And then I have to explain to them, those don't show up in these models. So that's not represented in my answer right now. And so you have to include that in your accounting for uncertainty. And it's hard when someone's trying to plan for something that they need a physical a number for so that they can actually build a thing that's supposed to last for 100 years, like stormwater infrastructure. Um, but I can't give them a number. And I have to say, really, it's up to you and how much risk you're willing to take. And also, just physics-wise, we can't do better than this right now. Um, so that, those are always hard conversations to have with people. And I th for me, the approach to dealing with it, one is understanding how hard that is. It's like, I, I do need a number from you, though. And so, um, and then walking them through, I like to talk about a risk-informed approach, that if you're building something for certain timelines that you were talking about, Maybe think about using something closer to the 90th percentile rather than something the 25th percentile and thinking about what are you building, what is the decision you're actually making, um, and why do you need, how protected do you need this to be, and talking through that. So it's always a much longer conversation when we're dealing with extreme precipitation, and that's largely just due to we can't do better with the physics right now um, to model you know, cloudburst events, they're these small scale convective events in rainfall. Um, and so as a scientist, that bothers me. And as a communicator, that's really, really hard to work through. Um, and that's something that we're working on in, in, with Marisa and trying to build out, in addition to the tools, the educational materials um, that not just the people who are making the decisions need to make, but need to give to their constituents to talk about why they're making the decisions that they're making. Um, because we're not used to saying, this is our best guess of how bad the rainfall might be, so we're planning for that. Um, and so I think with things that are going on with COVID, people have experienced much more uncertainty in their day-to-day -day life. And so I think that that's allowing more useful conversations to happen about uncertainty and hopefully opens up some doors mm -hmm. with communicating with constituencies about, okay, well, we need to spend more money on this because of this uncertainty and because we want to protect ourselves in these ways. Thank you. So Chris, I know that you have spent a lot of time helping people make good decisions that they're not completely sure about how things are going to change. So would you be willing to talk about some of the strategies that have helped with that? Yeah, I, I've, I've been a, a student of, of uh, how science gets to policy for a very long time. And uh, I had some observations about it. First is that scientists are really pretty bad at doing that. They, they don't really <laughs> like to get involved with policymakers. And I would say that policymakers aren't necessarily happy dealing with scientists, so we have a <laughs> cultural gap to bridge. Uh, it's important to understand the, the nature of the policy development process. My former colleagues, uh, Tom Stewart and Gerald Mumpower at SUNY Albany, uh, came up with uh, what they call the five levels of scientific policymaking. And this is a fairly old paper, it was 1991, they put this out. 
and it was specifically uh, focused on climate change. So people have been thinking about this in the public policy realm for a very long time. And the, f the first level is uh, basically raw data and facts to, on which to base judgments and form consensus. It's very objective. There's more certainty to it. You're taking real-time measurements, perhaps, <clears throat> and you have real data to work with. And the dis disciplinary realm that that is involved with is natural science, natural sciences. Eventually, you start to ag aggregate studies and, and bring things together and formulate hypotheses and develop more, better understanding. But you get a little less certainty. Uh, it becomes a little less objective because the human brain is, is, in a, is working the stuff over a lot more. Then you get to uh, interpretive reports and scientific models, which is very much a dis interdisciplinary e exercise. And then you come to the fourth level, which is broad conclusions based on evidence from lower levels, which starts to involve the social sciences. And uh, again, the certainty goes down uh, and uh, uh, the objectivity goes down. And then finally, the policy recommendations are given to the policy decision makers and uh, there, there's a lot of uh, subjective and value-based uh, uh, judgment with much less certainty. That makes the scientists very uneasy, but uh, it has to be the way it's going to work because ultimately the scientists are not uh, rarely the, the decision makers. So um, that's part of the, the, the real challenge is to, is, to, is to figure out how to get the two sides together. Thank you. Yeah, so Derek, I know you've wrestled with this a lot. You do a lot of hydrodynamic modeling and forecasting flood events. So could you talk about some, some strategies you've used in the modeling world to kind of constrain the uncertainty in those forecasts? Certainly. You know, as Chris and Krista and Anne have kind of pointed out, you know, it's difficult because uncertainty, you know, really complicates decision making. Um, and, you know, this information, you know, helps kind of inform, you know, making some of these expensive and important decisions. But, you know, as a result, you know, the complexity of the problem sometimes makes it where, you know, they can't make a decision. So mm -hmm. oftentimes in the last decade, we found the no decision decision to be the most popular. <laughs> uh, at least from a fiscal standpoint, it seems logical to not spend the money now if we don't know what's going to happen. Right. And, you know, the Virginia Coastal Policy Center actually published a report in 2017 that was commissioned that essentially just evaluated what happens if we don't do anything uh, related to this problem. And, you know, they did an excellent first attempt at kind of quantifying what the costs are attributed to, you know, myriad different sources. but estimated approximately uh, these costs to amount over a billion dollars in Virginia before the year 2050, uh, mostly attributed to traffic interruptions on roadways uh, where there's flooding and important commercial traffic routes, but also individual asset loss. Um, some of the challenges that are really involved here, of course, is the fact that the inherent albatross of research is that it's never quite done. So if you're waiting for all the facts mm -hmm. to come in, you're going to be waiting forever. <laughs> um, and that complicates things quite a bit, uh, mostly because we need those decisions to be made now to protect and ensure our future, not just from a national security perspective, but also just from identifying the issues that we're dealing with uh, as scientists are continuing to get a better grasp on this problem. Um, as it pertains to you know, flood forecasts, uh, really looking at the inherent assumptions of those types of models and dissecting specifically where our greatest uncertainties lie is a critically important way for us to understand and better enhance our forecasts looking forward to the future. Um, a lot of the ways that this is calculated is first looking at the problem itself, in this case sea level rise, trying to get a better grasp on the things that are affecting elevations. Because the thing that people care the most is, well, how deep is the water going to be if it's going to affect my area? And of course, the relative uncertainty associated with, well, how do we derive those elevations in the first place of the tops of the roadway surfaces, the edges of the buildings that I own as assets, and other places in between those spaces. But also the assumptions associated with how we're drawing out those extrapolated forecasts of what is this target you know, to the year 2050 or the year 2100? How high do we anticipate sea levels going to rise in that time? Um, you know, as you know, it's kind of pointed out <laughs> by the other panel speakers, they're identifying, well, just pick one in terms <laughs> of the scenario. Don't tell me all the possible things that could happen. Conceptually, trying to identify that cone of uncertainty is complex. And of course, as a modeler, I have to run all of those scenarios. And then for them to say, well, we only want like 10% of the work that you did to drive all the decision making moving forward. 
that's difficult <laughs> from a lot of perspectives, <laughs> mostly because uh, it seems like some of the work that I do is esoteric if we just pick one. But at the same time, you know, that's exactly, you know, what is sometimes needed. You know, our decision makers will say, well, we understand that all the scenarios are important, but, you know, a lot of the guiding legislation with an executive order put out by Governor Northam a couple years ago in Virginia said, well, let's look at NOAA's intermediate high scenario. Base a lot of your planning on that. Yes, there's five other scenarios that NOAA also put out in this same report. And they're also important for a variety of different reasons, but in terms of our planning perspectives moving forward, even if we overshoot this target, it means that we're still prepared for storm surge from major hurricanes between now and then. So no one's going to complain that we overbuilt or overprepared, but at the very least, we're hoping that we're not underprepared. And so from those perspectives, when we're looking at elevation assumptions, there's some things from a mathematical perspective that we can do to enhance our uncertainty understanding, because there are compounding influences. You know, the land is sinking, the water elevations are rising, and starting, starting to understand, well, what are the differences in the offsets of those uncertainty measurements? They really start to compound and make the issue much more complex. Mm -hmm. That's where that cone of uncertainty comes yeah. from, is all the contributing factors stacking on top of each other, making it more difficult and sometimes more paralyzing to make a decision. So technologically speaking, from a modeling perspective, usually we're looking at technologies to leverage our decision making and saying, well, the technologies are getting better. Our elevation assumptions are becoming more constrained. You know, we're getting better information from elevation certificates and buildings that are helping us better understand what is the surface elevation at the bottom of the foundation of that building? What is the first floor elevation of that building? If we have a storm surge that comes up adjacent to that structure, one and a half feet above that, according to electrical codes since the 1980s, so that building's probably total because it's now hit all the electrical systems in that building. You're gonna gut most of the walls and the building's gonna cost you probably 150 to 200,000 minimum to fix. So some of these things in terms of informing economic elements that are involved in rebuilding, and especially with repetitive loss properties, these are things that we're starting to get a better grasp on exactly how this is being handled, not just from a state perspective, but also federally through the National Flood Insurance Program. Did you want to respond, yeah. Chris? Yeah. Uh, I, I'd like to emphasize how, how much improvement there's been in our computer modeling. Our models are way, way better than they were 30, 40 years ago. The, the horsepower behind our computers is, is awesome now. That enables us to do uh, shorter time steps and uh, smaller uh, unit area of uh, uh, measurement. And uh, if you look at the IPCC reports, which are based on global climate models, uh, we're up to the six now, I believe. And they're very careful about stating their confidence at, in each of the various reports. And uh, they're, in the first report, they, they were very tentative about how much they could say uh, climate change was occurring. And now we get up to the six, and they're actually getting rather specific and putting real numbers to it. Uh, there's still a lot of concern and doubt about where we're headed, because uh, the, uh, the magic uh, 1.5 degrees is probably going to be uh, well exceeded. And uh, what course humanity is going to take in dealing with the greenhouse gas problem is still very unknown. And uh, that, that's going to be the big question in my mind in the future. Yeah, I think that's a great lead in, Chris, to our next one. I was actually hoping Krista could talk to us a little bit about. So now we have this data. We have better models. We actually have really good models as things go. We have really good data. How do we translate it into tools? What are the really important tools that we need to focus on? Oh. Oh. <laughs> All right, so mood lighting for this answer. Um, <clears throat> so <laughs> so um, this is something that uh, Marisa has been tackling uh, for a number of years, and we've built out a suite of various tools um, to help with different aspects of communicating um, climate and uh, the results of modeling. Um, one tool that, I, so I'm going to just, you know, share all the cool stuff that we've done. Um, the one of them that I think is really fantastic and was designed originally for events like this, and of course I forgot them at home, are uh, these community climate outlooks. Uh, they are county-based um, summary, just a single piece of paper, a summary of different relevant climate impacts for that county. Um, it's a really great entry point to this is what's going on, and these are in linking not just you know, one and a half degrees of warming, 
but actually linking it to what that means for your experience. So in terms of increased flooding, in terms of changing of the timing of the seasons, messing with agriculture, so, and we highlight different impacts depending on which community it is, whether it's a coastal community, an inland community, um, urban and rural. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are really great introductory tools, I think particularly for audiences like decision makers who haven't thought about this before, constituencies that you need to get on board um, with climate impacts. And so those are really great tools and Molly actually uh, helped develop those. Um, and then I, I think the, the co-production process that um, we've taken with community climate outlooks, um, an intensity, duration, and frequency curve tool, so looking at um, extreme precipitation in the um, mid-Atlantic region, and on a tool that um, was published just in November, the Climate and Hazard Mitigation Planning Tool, or CHAMP. Um, that um, tool in, in particular, we've spent, I think, four years in a co-production process with folks in local governments, um, and with Kristen Baja at the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, talking about what people need to make their hazard mitigation plans into forward-looking documents and easily incorporate climate and hazard information into those plans. And one of the big things that has come out of that, one is confronting on a regular basis that my mental model is not the same as uh, people who have to use the information, mm -hmm. and that got hammered in really well <laughs> over four years. Um, it's also people who have to make these decisions, this is not the only thing on their plate. And so as much as we can do to do the interpretation for them, not just, here's some science, I made it easier for you, here's a plot, but also in addition to having the plots and, and visualizations that we put together, we have explanatory text that people can then use in other um, documents like hazard mitigation plans, but say, this is what as a scientist I see in this plot. This is what this means. Um, and taking some of that overhead away and doing it for folks so that, one, you're not coming to the incorrect conclusions, and two, so that they might actually use it, because there is a barrier between here's the trend line that I see as a scientist all the time and know what it means, but to interpret that into what impacts are, what your planning needs might be, and providing that alongside of it. And so I think those additional steps to, with tools will increase their usability and usefulness and hopefully um, increase capacity in the region. And that's something that's come up a lot in our processes lately. Um, it's something that's lacking in um, our intensity, duration, frequency curve tools. We didn't have the funding to do that part yet, but we're working on building out those materials as well. So there's a, there's a whole of experience um, that gets to the tools, and we're working on um, building some of those out. And I think CHAMP and the Community Climate Outlooks do some of the best um, at providing that explanatory part in addition to making the data easily accessible. Yeah, thank you, Krista. So those are tools that are regional in scope, but yeah. work on local levels, are aimed yes, at local yes, decisions. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, CHAMP covers the Carolinas, the Mid-Atlantic, and uh, Great Lakes regions. We worked with some other um, climate adaptation partnership teams to build that out. And we have regional level text, state level text, and county level text explaining different uh, climate data and impacts. And so it can be, it's useful at a, a broad range of scales. And the community climate outlooks are, are um, county focused and are like a mini like climate assessment for your county. Yeah, thank you. So, um, Anne, I was wondering if you could talk about, so we, you know, these are for local decision makers and regional, mm -hmm. but we also have a lot of organizations like the DOD that work on national scales, global scales. What kind of information and tools are really important for them? So, yeah, I'll, I'll share a, f a few thoughts. Um, you know, so, some of the, the panelists here have already talked about uh, climate modeling, which I think is obviously a, an extremely important uh, type of tool for an organization like the, the DOD and um, the department and the services within the department have developed a lot of tools uh, to, to help with modeling and assessment of risk. Uh, but I have to admit, I am not the person to talk about those specific tools. Uh, but what I can talk about is kind of the level um, that I'm working on, which 
and, and we have touched on it already, is, is really all about um, data analytics and, and visualization and, and trying to um, understand what, what we can learn from the data that we have. Uh, and so I'll just give an example of some of the projects that I've been working on most recently or that our team has been working on most recently uh, are, are looking at uh, how uh, a, an organization like Department of Defense can uh, reduce its, its, carbon, its carbon impact, its greenhouse gas emissions from a building's standpoint um, by electrifying and decarbonizing its buildings. And so, as you all, I'm sure, are very aware, Department of Defense is just an enormous organization with a global footprint. So hundreds of thousands of buildings across hundreds of installations all over the world. And, and those um, installations and those uh, military departments and services are collecting lots of data about those buildings in various systems and in various ways by various people with varying purposes. And so we've been working on a project to try and um, aggregate some of that data from mainly asset management uh, platforms and systems, um, specifically Builder, which was developed um, by the, I believe, the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, specifically for the Department of Defense. So a, a tool like that is, is all about managing assets, looking at um, building uses, building life, types of systems, equipment, their condition, service life. And we're trying to aggregate all that data and try to learn things from it, like where are the opportunities to electrify? Where are the systems that are relying on fossil fuel energy sources? Where are uh, the opportunities for um, doing uh, you know, significant retrofits of buildings based on, based on their life and condition. And so, you know, we, we've built out a, a database to, to collect all that data. Um, we're using uh, SQL Server is, is the tool we're using for that. But, but then we need, a, we need a way to analyze and, and sort of visualize that, that data. So um, we're using tools like Tableau to run queries against the, the data that we have and, and to um, glean in information and, and knowledge like uh, the, the opportunities that I was talking about. You know, where can we uh, you know, see significant improvements um, to the, the building inventory, the, the building stock based on that information or that data? And I'll just reiterate that there's a lot of data and it's kind of messy uh, because there's lots of sources of inputs and at different times and for, for various purposes. And so um, we're looking at opportunities to use machine learning to, um, to help us read that data um, in a better way to, to get better outputs. So I think there's you know, maybe two ways that we're using these tools you know, one is to learn and, and make recommendations about how we can uh, get better inputs. And then, uh, you know, sort of the, the flip side of that is, is what, what can we do, what kind of um, tools can we use to get better outputs. So um, I think the final thing I would mention, which isn't, I guess, technically a tool, but uh, I just wanted to mention a couple of programs um, that I think represent an approach uh, which I, I guess I'm going to say as a kind of tool. Uh, and, and this is all about um, research and development and field demonstrations. So um, the, the DOD has two programs, and I'm used to saying the acronyms, and I know all of you are very acronym uh, <laughs> familiar. Uh, so CERDIP is the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program, and ESTCP is the Environmental... Security Technology Certification Program. I think I've got that right. Um, so these two companion programs that, that DOD funds are really all about looking at new technologies 
um, r researching you know, how those new technologies can be uh, adopted by the Department of Defense, and then field testing and demonstrating those technologies you know, at the installation level. And so I think, again, maybe not so much a tool, but you know, kind of going back to something I had mentioned earlier in terms of uncertainties around technologies, I think this is a super important approach for the Department of Defense to understand where opportunities are to adopt new technologies and to actually see how they can work uh, for the DOD specifically uh, on the ground. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to come back to a little compare and contrast between your two answers that I think was really important is that when we talk on a local scale, our tools are almost always talking about how we can understand risk and how we can adapt to risk. When we start to move up in scale through regional and to global, then we can start talking about mitigating risk. Um, and so that's a really different conversation, but a really important part of it. Um, so now I'm gonna move on, Chris. Could you talk a little bit about if we, when we get this new information, we have data, we have tools, how do we get that into the policies? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's where you need your secret sauce. Um, it, it moves in a variety of ways. Sometimes it flows fairly easily because the answers are pretty obvious, but that's not usually the case. So uh, the, the most important thing for me is to, is to have good communication. There needs to be good, clear communication between the people that do the science and the people that need to be informed about what the science means. And uh, as I said, that's an uneasy uh, thing to do. Um, I like to give advice to, to scientists about how they can be more effective in the process. Uh, they have to understand the science policy continuum that I talked about. They have to also understand the needs of the people they're trying to communicate with. What are the legal and other ramifications that these folks are looking uh, to deal with? Um, they've got to communicate clearly, and they've got to recognize that uh, few policymakers have scientific backgrounds. And it really is important to be patient and uh, have respect for them in their roles. Uh, and as we've seen from the COVID experience, uh, arrogance is not a good idea. And uh, s certain advisors have been more than arrogant, and it's caused the, the public to lose confidence in the, in the science, which is something that I really think is a big issue. Uh, I like to try to keep long-term relationships with policymakers. Uh, I can remember, um, when Senator, our Senator Cassidy was a, in the House of Representatives, I had dialogues with him about climate change, and he was very much opposed to having any discussion of it. And now he is, he's clearly accepting it and understanding mm -hmm. that it's something that needs to be dealt with. And uh, I guess, I hope that answers your question, yeah. but it's, it's a, a, a very challenging thing. It is a challenging thing. I think something we need to work on continuously, but I think those are some really great insights. Um, so I'm just going to wrap up with one more question, then we'll open up to audience questions. And so I'd like to ask Derek, I know you've been involved with a lot of cutting edge technology, cell phone apps and all that kind of stuff. Can you talk about some ways that new technologies can help us be more resilient? Certainly. So, you know, some of the interesting things about developing these models that help us kind of better comprehend, you know, the influences that, you know, coastal flooding resiliency kind of bears towards our future. Um, you know, our models are getting better. You know, Chris thankfully reminded me that it's like, I see our models all the time. I know they're great. I know they're <laughs> extremely resolute and their temporal and spatial, res you know, res resolution is incredible. Uh, you know, the Adapt Virginia portal that Molly mentioned at the introduction to this session, you know, we're able to look at, you know, the tide watch forecast 36 hours into the future. The Virginia Institute of Marine Science develops and publishes twice daily at noon and midnight on that website, are showing you every hour over the next 36 hours in these overlapping forecasts that update twice a day. With the next overlapping 36 hour period looking forward, you can look down to the spatial scale somewhere between five to one meters in spatial resolution 
depending on what part of the state you're in, it will show you specifically where on which portions of the city blocks or sections of your street will be flooded. And people do use it, even though the disclaimer explicitly says not to use it for exactly <laughs> this reason. But they'll decide whether or not it's safe to street park their car in Norfolk or whether they need to move it into a parking deck during you know, the tidal flooding season. Uh, so our technologies are getting better you know, from a hydrodynamic modeling perspective that allow us to better understand storm tide and inundation periods. How long are these events going to last and you know, what do we need to do to plan for them, both in the near term but also in the far term looking out in the long term projections for sea level rise. Uh, from sensor development, there's some really cool new water level sensors that we've been developing. I run a program called StormSense. We've established a lot of new low cost, low energy water level sensors using ultrasonic sonar and KA band radar sensors. And we deployed over 50 of those throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia in the last five years. And this is meant mostly to substitute and otherwise, or excuse me, not substitute, but supplement the data that are being already provided by the US Geological Survey and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which each have their own specific federal focuses on exactly where these sensors need to go. But a lot of the communities are trying to make these local decisions in terms of where do we need to make these stormwater revetments and changes in the existing sections of our communities that are being regularly impacted as the water tables rise due to sea level rise. So from the sensor development perspective, there's some new machine learning and artificial intelligence sensors that are using web cameras and calibrated sections of vertical pilings or platforms or bridge edges, you know, whatever it can find within the field of view, to actually start to interpret information using edge detection within what's in the field of view and the resilient, you know, background of that electromagnetic radiation. So it's pretty cool to be able to see what's in the webcam and immediately interpret what those water elevations are. We've been able to collaborate with the U.S. Geological Survey's next generation water level observing and sensing network to be able to involve that with some of the sensors right here in Virginia Beach in Virginia with the goal of potentially exploring what this might look like if we employed this in other places throughout the United States. And so this is a passive remote sensing technology based on the successes that have happened with active remote sensors like LIDAR, radar, and sonar. Uh, and then finally, of course, from a geographic information systems and mapping perspective, you know, building these digital maps help us better understand where the water's going to be in the future. As I mentioned earlier, being able to see on an interactive map what my, you know, where my commute is, where my house is, where my work is, relative to where the water's going to be now and in the future, under these different sea level rise projections, helps better understand, you know, where I might want to purchase real estate or not purchase real estate in the near future but it also kind of helps better understand specifically, you know, what the implications are now. There's a new mobile app called Sea Level Rise that's available on iOS and Android platforms that we've used to help validate a lot of our hydrodynamic model predictions. Now that we're getting such high resolution spatial coverage, well, it's not sufficient to validate it with five or six water level sensors that are within this county or city. We now wanna know, well, what does it look like on each city street and block? And so as a result, we've recruited a large uh, cadre of an, uh, environmental enthusiasts that will use this app and basically repeatedly press a button on their phone as they drop digital GPS breadcrumbs along the high water line during king tides, usually in the fall. And so as a result, this helps us do you know, very public tidal calibration of these products that we are regularly pushing out as environmental forecasts of what the near term looks like in terms of flooding. And now we've got six years worth of data since we started that project called Catch the King back in 2017. A lot of our media groups in Hampton Roads, you know, were very strong supporters of it, including Dave Mayfield, a former environmental reporter at the Virginian Pilot in Norfolk, but also the Daily Press and Newport News. It's very difficult to get these media groups to collaborate together on projects. Mm -hmm. So it was really cool to see how that came together. And we had over 750 volunteers collect data during a six hour period that year. And we won the Guinness World Record for becoming the world's largest environmental survey. We collected over 60,000 verification points in a single tidal cycle, all throughout the southeastern portion of Chesapeake Bay. So being able to validate these data using newer technologies has been critical in our understanding moving forward. All right, thank you. Sorry, we have a little B visitor over here. Um, <laughs> uh, so that is all of our my questions for the panel, but we'd like to open it up to the audience for questions. Um, I will tell you the most common question I get as a scientist is when should I sell my waterfront house? Um, <laughs> And we don't have an answer for that for you today, but lots of knowledge up here. Hi, 
Hi, thank you very much. Um, I was very compelled, uh, Anne, by your comments um, because when I joined the United States Navy, I was commissioned back in 1981, did a lot of my sea tours here in Norfolk, uh, first sea tours down in Charleston. There was not uh, any kind of consideration for environmental concerns. And we got progressively better uh, happily over time. So really don't have a, a question, but just more of a statement. As the United States Navy learned, we're doing some interesting things. I was just down in Norfolk uh, with Fleet Forces Command about a week ago, and they're gearing up for another large-scale exercise. They did one of these in 2021. It was 25,000 personnel, 17 time zones, five fleets, three marine expeditionary forces, and three combatant commanders all over the world. But half of the force stayed in port. And the way they were able to do this was with uh, an innovation and training called Live Virtual Constructive. That cuts down on the carbon footprint, it reduces the use of fossil fuels, and uh, depletion of uranium in a reactor plant if you're nuclear powered. And it also keeps uh, sailors at home and, and less wear and tear on them as well as the ships. So I think that's commendable, although we need to do more. We're doing the same thing in flight training. A lot of the F-35, I mean, I've been in a simulator, I'm a submariner, and if I can land an F-35, so can you. Um, <laughs> it does not substitute for tactical training at sea where you've got to be able to fight the aircraft, though. But we're spending less flying hours, less fuel to train those aviators. And, uh, you know, when I got in, uh, dumping trash overboard was a norm. Uh, it is no longer. There's a zero tolerance for plastic in the water, oil or oil sheen in the water, and we're reducing uh, the ability of a ship to go fast. I mean, we'd leave port all ahead flank cavitate. Not anymore. We, ha we, we go at the most efficient and economic speed, which means, you know, again, less wear and tear on the engines and the carbon footprint, uh, unless you're a nuclear-powered warship. So I think things are looking up. Um, we can always do better. And I think the Na U.S. Navy gets it, and hopefully we'll continue to move forward. When I was in Italy, they actually changed out the power plant for the base there to make it more efficient German engineering, and it saved money, and we got money back on our lease. So that was refreshing. So thanks for your comments. I thought that was very interesting. If I could just... Thank you. Yeah, would you like to respond to that? I wanted question? to follow up on that. Um, it's obvious the Department of Defense is playing a major role in, in, uh, in changing policy. And uh, I, have, I have to agree with you. It's a, it's a great thing that is being done. Um, one thing that does worry me a, a lot, though, is the lack of education in our high schools in particular about the broader geosciences, about environmental sciences. It's a huge gap. And uh, I'm not sure why it exists, but it really needs to be dealt with because we need an informed public to be able to understand these issues. And uh, I, I think that's something that is going to be one of the great challenges of the next decade. More informed decision makers would be, yeah, a good thing. Yeah, looking at the residential uh, real estate and lending market, uh, where we're used to the 100-year floodplain maps, are you seeing any trending where we'll have more dynamic decision making based on micro issues? Also, looking at local government in terms of their stormwater management uh, planning as well as operations in terms of keeping their systems uh, clear. Who wants to take that? Krista or Anne? Either of you seem a good, <laughs> a good fit. Well, I'm not sure if I can answer that question. Yeah. You, you may be better. Yeah, I can't answer the um, real estate question, but when I've talked to folks about putting in new stormwater regulations, there is a lot of back and forth with development and trying to manage um, floodplains and things like that. People, I think my impression is people know that the 100 year floodplain is not necessarily the only place it's going to flood because you know people have been paying attention over the past decade, particularly with uh, storm water issues. Um, but yeah, mostly I'm trying to balance what people want to do in terms of tax revenue and development with what they think are responsible decisions with stormwater. That's, that's a big barrier in trying to make um, progress in uh, climate-informed stormwater regulations, as far as I can tell. Um, that's based off of you know, a non-published study, and so you take that with the appropriate caveats. But that, that's what I've been hearing when I've been 
talking to um, planners. Well, I know Chris wants to say something. I guess I, I, this probably doesn't answer your question, but I guess I would say, you know, there's a real communication, there's an opportunity for better communication, I think, with, you know, a phrase like the 100-year flood, because I think people hear that and it's like, okay, it's only gonna flood once mm -hmm. every 100 years, and, and that's not what that means. And so I think, what a great opportunity to kind of change the way that we communicate that kind mm -hmm. of messaging. I just wanted to comment a little bit about the issue of compound flooding, which is when you have storm surge and then a precipitation event that sort of the double whammy, a bad situation. Um, we have not been very good at that kind of uh, modeling and prediction <coughs> because we only recently started to focus on it. But I see a lot of progress occurring in that area. We have some modelers down at LSU that are uh, developing some much better models to give a much better in informed uh, advice to people on, on policy. I think that'll play a big role. I imagine Derek is, feels the same way. Oh yeah, definitely. I know Hurricane Harvey in 2017 was a pretty big wake-up call. You know, a lot of us, you know, we're dealing with you know these heavy rainfall events, and you're seeing these you know truly catastrophic amounts of rainfall that are you know driving water from the inland back towards the shore, but it's being met with the storm surge from the other side. And, you know, the compound influences are not fully understood, you know, partially because, you know, our rainfall prediction needs to be good enough that we can actually calculate the volume of the amount of rainfall coming down in advance to actually then meet up with the storm surge that's coming from the other direction. You know, our models have gotten better at being able to handle this, but then now trying to be able to actually atmospherically calculate how much rain is going to fall from the clouds from the storm is really difficult to understand. You know, especially on the East Coast where we've got the Appalachian Mountains that sometimes acts as more or less a barrier that will sometimes scrape the bottoms of those clouds and you have a lot more rain falling than expected mm -hmm. or a lot less depending on if there's another front coming over the mountains at the same time to meet it. You know, we've seen this with Norida or Hurricane Ida meeting up with the Nor'easter offshore, you know, as recently as 2009 here on the East Coast as well. And that caused some major flooding in the Hampton Roads region of Virginia. Um, of course, 2018 Hurricane Florence also had catastrophic amounts of rainfall, a lot of dam breaks in North and South Carolina. Thankfully here, by the time it made it to Virginia, its storm surge was pretty nominal, but we still had a lot of rainfall. So the influences of compound flooding really complexifies this issue. But our models are getting better at calculating and handling it. Great. Do we have any other questions? We have time for probably two more questions. Hello. I'd just like to thank all you guys for coming out and talking for us today. So my question really draws back to the beginning of this talk and the modeling you guys were talking about. So uh, we obviously need to make substantial infrastructure investments to fight climate change, improve. How do you, how do you balance the, those modeling with making the best infrastructure plans and crafting that policy? Hmm. That's, a, that's, that's, a, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that we figured it out yet. Yeah, <laughs> And I can say from the modeling side, usually the modeling, you know, portion is a much cheaper portion of the budget than the other <laughs> elements. And unfortunately, it is oft overlooked because it's, you know, one of the things that usually goes into the first phase of planning and they're not willing to return back to that phase after it's been passed, which sometimes you get to the end of this planning process only to realize, well, we need more information and more simulations. And sometimes they're not willing to come back to that stage of, you know, reevaluating alternative plans. Um, uh, in terms of balancing these budgets, it's important to keep in mind, you know, modeling, not necessarily just from a deterministic standpoint, which is like these hydrodynamic models we've been talking about, but also a better complex understanding of these probabilistic models, like, well, what is the 100 or 500 year floodplain? We understand it based on requirements for flood insurance for people that have mortgages, but the problem gets a lot more difficult when you're dealing with policy related issues. And, well, okay, I own my house outright, and my family's lived here for four generations. You know, we now fully own that property. Do we need flood insurance or don't we, based on the information that we currently have? And probabilistic models saying that we're just on the edge of the 100-year floodplain. What does that look like in the future? You know, FEMA doesn't currently calculate future floodplains, only the current one. Uh, I have, so something that has come up in uh, a lot of RAND work 
is using robust decision making techniques for things like that. And um, it's basically where you run all the models mm -hmm. and then you try to find what um, key decisions or levers where, um, okay, this is a robust decision, so it's valid across a lot of different potential futures, rather than optimization, which is a little bit easier computationally. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have multiple objectives, like balancing, okay, this is the adaptation that I want to do, and this is the cost that I have, you can't optimize for two things at the same time. So it's taking a broad look across a lot of different potential futures, and then trying to find ways that, okay, we do okay across a bunch of different things. Um, and when you can, taking an adaptive approach, and this is often hard to do with policymakers and decision makers, but the idea that this decision that you're making isn't final and trying to find indicators that say, okay, now it's time to reevaluate your decision because this thing that we told you to look for is happening mm -hmm. now. So then, okay, in our original decision, we built in these branches for you to go down depending on what's happening. And instead of having deterministic mm -hmm. decisions or this is the decision that I'm making, this is the decision forever, trying to have adaptation built into your decision-making process that's informed by a full suite of models. Mm -hmm. So I'm um, happy to share um, some reports and things like that that go into that in a little bit more detail. But I think that's a really great framework for making these multi-objective decisions and incorporating these really great models at the same time. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up, Krista. I do think that's a really important way of trying to embrace the uncertainty in decision making. Um, so I realize lunch is, is next, so <laughs> I know we had a question down here. I know speakers got a question back there. Um, so maybe if we can ask quickly and then we'll move on to lunch. Chris, as someone who spent a career balancing the challenges of communicating science and communicating or trying to affect good policy, I'm often told that, uh, over my career that scientists should limit their opinions. They should communicate the science to the policymakers, the policymakers make the decisions. How do you balance that when I'm sure you've got opinions at times, <laughs> and how do you withhold perhaps what your opinions might be? And how do you, what would you tell young scientists? To how, do they, how do they manage it? That, that's a really, really great question. Um, it's, a, it's very difficult because not only are we scientists, but we're also citizens. And so we have a stake in what's going on. And the, there is that tendency to be pushed a little too far sometimes, to be advocates. Um, I know back when I was working on the Chesapeake, uh, I was very involved in the nitrogen limitation problem and whether nitrogen or phosphorus was more important. And I think at some point I got a little bit too much in the advocacy role of that. Uh, and um, it was because I was very passionate about it. I had information that I knew was pertinent and I wanted to, to pass it on. It's, it's, a very hard, it's a very hard one, but you have, to, you have to sort of be introspective. You have to ask yourself, am I transgressing here? Am I going beyond the limits of what my role is? And uh, that, that's the advice I'd give a young scientist. Thank you. Yeah, let's take the... Yeah, Molly, thanks. Um, real quickly, uh, one thing that hasn't really been discussed here too much is the private sector, particularly the financial markets, uh, looking at issues of uncertainty, risk, assessing the situation, and driving the markets on how things are going to happen in the real world, so to speak. Um, so we mentioned earlier the Federal Reserve requirement for banks to uh, assess the risk in their portfolios. Other banks are being compelled to do that. What starts at those big banks are going to, is going to trickle down through the other financial, uh, through the other lenders eventually. The insurance markets obviously are paying attention to this. Rating agencies, Moody's has already dived into this a few years ago for the localities in this area even. And so the risk assessment in the academic level is happening, but the risk assessment in the private sector, particularly those financial markets, is happening in, in, in a big way. <laughs> and those things will drive the answers. They're gonna drive how this gets done in the private sector on real world decision making about who uses what property when and what kind of business you get to put where and so forth. Um, that is going to carry, that is gonna make a major force in this as we go forward one way or the other. So I just wanna make sure that that point has been made because that's an intersection of another decision making process, another set of ass assessment process intersecting with what's happening on the government nonprofit side uh, and for business folks, 
they're going to listen to their financial markets a lot more, probably. Yeah, I think there is a good point. There are a lot of different players. And I think even in this room, we have a lot of different people coming from different perspectives. Um, but I know we're, we've got lunch coming up. So what I'd like to give a round of applause to our panelists, um, who are fantastic. Thank you, guys. And then feel free to come up and ask them more, more questions as the day goes on. Thank you.